I just was interviewed for an article and uh, it said, tell us about your background. That was the first question. So I wrote, Frank McCourt, the Pulitzer Prize winning author of Angela's Ashes, was my creative writing teacher at Stuyvesant High School in New York City for two years. He would go into class every day and instead of teaching us about the Scarlet Letter or Moby Dick, he would tell us stories about his impoverished childhood in Ireland. This, I later learned, were, oh, these, I later learned, were the stories from his off-Broadway show, A Couple of Laggards, that he would develop into his world-famous memoir. He inspired me to be a writer. Everything I do stems from the fact that I am a writer and it is very difficult to get people to buy books or any written words. That was the first couple of paragraphs of this article. Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, it's fantastic. We met Frank actually when he was writing his book. We were introduced to him outside the gate there by a politician, a local politician who was a very good friend of Frank's. And he said, You must meet this guy, he's writing a very good book. And uh, Frank then came into the factory. You see, John's father bought Ho the building. Hold on a second. Hold on a yeah. second. Do you mind if I record this? No, Because problem. I have a radio show in New York City, oh. and I want to make this mm -hmm. into an interview for a whole yeah. episode. Oh, brilliant. Okay. So could you repeat about how hold on. it's all started? I, I, I understand okay. that. Yeah. So, voice. There we go. All right. How did you meet Frank McCord? I just happened to um, be introduced to him outside the gate here by a local politician who was a very good friend of his. He was Jim Kemi, a great character and very um, socialist person. So Frank, um, we said, read this guy, he's writing a very good book. So, gee, yeah, okay. So we brought him inside because John's father bought the building in 1956 and turned it into a menswear factory, employing a lot of people that went to, went to school here. And uh, Frank came in for the first time and walked all over the building and he said, just give me a minute, because the first time he came to the main door, because only the teachers are allowed through the main door, so just give me a minute, because this is sort of a bit uh, eerie, he said, because it was very emotional for him coming through the main door. And then he came through the whole building, he was remembering stuff and whatever, saying to John, what happened here, what happened there. And then he came back again for the making of the movie, and then he came back again for his, um, um, his honorary degree, he got um, conferred for an honorary degree of literature in the University of Limerick here. I was at that, and then he came back for a, a venture here and I asked him to do a walk on Limerick and stuff, and he did. He was like the Pied Piper, and like there were two people behind him, sort of, that's Frank McCourt, you know, looked behind about 30 people behind us, and it was great. But um, in all the times I met him, I never asked him for an autograph, and I thought, you know, oh, maybe sometime I'll just ask him, but I never forgot. Then he, he opened my art exhibition in New York in 2002 at an art exhibition. I'm an artist by profession. And then um, he, we became friendly, we were writing and stuff. And every time we came to Limerick, we met with him and stuff. And then when he, when he was sort of, I decided then to open a, a gallery here. And uh, I asked him to open it, but he was too ill to travel. But unfortunately, he died um, that same year. And then when he passed away, I decided to open a museum to him. Mm -hmm. I started off with one school desk and a little mannequin from a shop that had closed down with no feet in it. So I had to make the feet. And it just, it just expelled from, I mean, it just went viral, sort of. People were coming in with loads of stuff from memorabilia from the school, old photographs, old clothes and things. So it became like a shrine. So we have actually, um, when Malachi, Alfie and Mike were here for the unveiling of the bust in the garden, you probably saw the bust on the way in. I designed the bust and we put it in place. And when Malachi was here to officially launch the museum, he said, just give me a minute. He said, this just feels so, especially the bedroom and kitchen, I'll show you that upstairs. He said, it was just like home, <laughs> except they didn't have a sink. He said, that was a luxury they didn't have. And then it transpired that things just evolved from here and it became a sort of a shrine. People come from all over the world to visit the place and it just heartens me that you actually are here today. It's incredible, you know, that you were in the same school as Frank was teaching at. Have not a lot of people from Stuyvesant High School come here? I'm a few, 
Um, I've been to Stuyvesant School and give a talk there, uh -huh. and they're studying Angela's Ashes at the are. time, and they were going to come back and do a project here, maybe this year or whatever, but it's probably sadly too late. It's a long way from long New York way. City to Limerick. Yeah, not too bad, because I mean, I've been there a few times. My daughter lived there for a while, but it's just, a, it's a poignant story. And a lot of people in Limerick, when the book came out first, they didn't like the book. Even though they didn't read it, you know, <laughs> you ask them, you know, what oh, don't you like about the book? Well, ah, it's all lies. And I said, oh, it's his story. It's a memoir. I mean, you didn't live in his shoes. You didn't live in his house. And they wouldn't have read it. And then I said, oh, well, then read it and judge your own opinion on it, you know. But it, it touches the heartstrings of everybody around the world. We get Japanese, we get Australians, New Zealand people. Everywhere around the world, you name it, have been here. And they actually, one lady was here one day and she was crying on the steps outside. And I said, oh my God, she left her falling down the stairs. She's going to sue me for a fortune. And I said, oh God, are you okay? I'm just happy to be here. She said, I can't believe I'm here in the Frank McCourt Museum. So it's just amazing, you know? So, oh, I'm going to take you on a tour. Okay. Leave that. 415. I'm just going to, I'm going to put my coat downstairs. All right. No, put it here. Well, we, we don't we have, have it downstairs. Our... We don't have such a luxury of well, well, we have a, uh, we have our suitcases behind the door. So I'm just going to put this but over the suitcases. They're very the suitcase heavy. suitcase is up. They're very heavy. <laughs> They're um, very heavy. I'll no, be right back. Are you sure? Yeah. I close the door. Close okay. the front door. Okay. That's the best. Yay. Just so, close the front so, door. So, so what was this building originally? This, this building was actually a school. It was actually purposely built by William Leamy, who saw the need for um, educating Protestants and Catholics together. But near the twain would meet because the Protestants and Catholics, it would have been a great time in the 1800s to actually do that, a great foresight to bring the two religions mm -hmm. together. But six months of the year was run by the Protestant board and the other six months of the year was run by Catholic board. And it became eventually a Catholic school, all boys. It was a sort of a school that was, um, it wasn't a run of the mill school. It was sort of a school that would take wayward boys as such, but it got a basic education. They got, um, they were taught Latin, they were taught geography, geometry, and maths, and of course, Irish and English and, and history. So it was actually basic for your foundation of life mm -hmm. as such, but they did up to 13 years of age. But a lot of the people then, when when the school um, was here, it eventually died off really because I don't know whether it was a privately funded school and then the government took over ownership. And of course, when the government take over their rules and regulations, you see it inside. I mean, rules and regulations of corporal punishment printed out by the Department of Education. I mean, it's horrific. And then you have, um, it was vacant for about, it closed down in 1952. And my father-in-law, my late father-in-law, bought it in 1956 and turned it into a menswear factory employing 120 people. And of course, all the artifacts that were at the school, Had he probably gone. just threw them out because sure. he needed room for machinery and whatever. And one of the stu one of the pupils was Cyril Benson. He went to school with Frank and didn't yeah. like Frank because Frank, he was a great champion Irish dancer. Hold on a second, hold on, hold on. <laughs> is it okay for me to be shooting it this way, this angle? Yes, yeah, I mean, it is yeah. what it is. Um, it goes on for an hour. I, I, I mean, yeah, yeah, of course. We'll go in through anyway and I'll show you. Yeah, right? let's go in. Let's go in. Yeah. So you're coming into the school. And this is the way Frank would have come into school. See, they weren't allowed, as I said, to the main door. Yep. Only the teachers. So Frank would have walked in this way. I would love him to be here today and be what I've done for it, you know? So these are actually genuine photographs of the school. Sure. This man would have thought Frank. Um, I think he's Odie. He's Odie, is it? Mr. O'Neill. Mr. O'Neill. Mr. O'Neill. And they would come in without shoes. Do you remember reading the book where Frank's father mended his shoes with the tires of the bicycle? Yeah. They would get a cup of milk in the morning and scroll when they came in. And these are generally photographs in the first class in the movies. This is a drawing I did of his mother and father, Angela and Maliki Sr. And when they came back from New York, this is the house they stayed in. This is their grandmother's house. But of course, the father was drinking and carousing the whole time. So 
she just couldn't put up with him. She said, listen, I'll pay for a house, a room for you for a few months. Get a job then and look after yourselves, you know. So I don't know whether that's a baby from the McCord family. Has they come on with twins? This is Frank here at school. Wow. Yeah. And this is Billy, his friend. And Frank. And Frank is just here. And then this is the lane they lived in. This is Billy again. And Frank is on the opposite side behind the people there, which is a pity, isn't it? I hope we don't. Photograph it down. I got it. Better. You got it? And most of the kids you think are girls wearing little dresses, but in actual fact the boys, they have a lot of impetigo, you know, which is, which is comes from not washing properly and whatever. This is Frank. He's very good at school. He doesn't say a word. Well, there were kids here yesterday that were messing, you know. These are the type of shoes that I've worn. I mean, feel the weight of that shoe. Wow. I mean, these little skinny legs, but they were hobnail boots and it lasts forever. There was a prized possession. A lot of them would actually wear them around their necks going to school to save the studs, which is incredible. And then you have, this is Frank here again at school. Yes, it is. And this is Billy, his friend. And actually, these are various photographs of what, who Frank met in his lifetime and stuff. This is the last place he lived, Roden Lane. I have a virtual reality tour of it with Maliki doing the um, narrating and it's very interesting, it's very good. These are the teachers that thought Frank and this is the teacher Hoppy O'Holloran. It was called Hoppy O'Holloran because he did a little bit of a wrong foot or something and he took great interest in Frank so much so that he'd bring the essays home to his house and read them to the family and that he said he wrote this, Frank wrote that at the age of 11 and he the teacher wouldn't believe that he wrote it, so he brought his father up to say, did you help him with that? He said, no, he said, Frank wrote that, you know. So this was a story he wrote, the, the weather and, and Jesus, you know. And this is actually what I was telling you about, corporal, corporal punishment by the Department of Education. This was actually a rule laid out by the government, how to inflict corporal punishment on children. So, I mean, and it was all... Um, this was actually the teacher's desk from the school, the blackboard and the clock. And some of the maps are actually from Mimi's school as well. People were brilliant at bringing in stuff, you know. These are the type of pens that Frank would have written. And it was an ink. You had to dip your pen into the inkwell and then you had to use the pen. Prized possession, right? So this is the, actually the floorboards that Frank would have walked on. See the floorboards in the school there? Unfortunately, yeah. I haven't taken it all up, but I can't afford it, you know. Sure. So that was the floorboards. And then this is the dunce's desk that people, I mean, inflicting more punishment on them. If you were bold or, or didn't do your homework properly, you set at this for most of the day. And the most humiliating thing was to face the class, you know, you'd be sitting on that all day. This is a bit of fun. You could be a friend of Frank's. <laughs> Frank's writing is very funny as well as sad. So you can sit in there you put your neck in the guillotine, put your neck there. Yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. Here, let me get the whole one. Let me get, go You're ahead. You're going to take a selfie with Frank. And, uh, you can leave a comment on that then, Clinty. Later. And this is just showing you, um, Frank later on in life, he got a job at the Post and Telegrams and he was writing threatening letters to the money lender, got him a job to write threatening letters for people who were right. paying. Yeah. So he'd actually send, he'd deliver letters to his mother and his mother would open the letter and say, oh, look, Frank, this is a terrible letter, look. And he'd have written it. So was, oh, God, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean... He disguised his writing, and of course, the words he'd come up with were just totally crazy words, you know. This is just showing you Malachi's book and Alfie's book. There were three great writers and three different genres. Have you read Malachi's books? I haven't read Malachi's books. Malachi's books are very strange, very different um, genre to um, Frank. He's more verbose and very, you know, 
it's a different style. Whereas mm -hmm. Malachi, uh, Alfie then is a very gentle um, writer. But if you read all three brothers, you'd try and understand the father, which would be difficult to understand. So this is the badge you'd have worn, P and T. And then you come down here and you see Ellen, his widow, pulling. And Frank is pulling a pint in South Pub. He's actually pulling a pint in the pub that his father drank all the money in. Mm. And then this is me with Frank when he did a walk of Vengeance's Ashes. And when Frank came back for the second time, I presented him with a painting of our building. This is him doing a charity walk for me in 19, oh, 1994, 95 or something. This is his only child, Maggie, in the photograph there, the black and white. So they all relate to the story of Angela and Frank in the court. Then on the wall here, we have some letters written to Angela from, his, from Frank and vice versa. And with the death notice of his twin brothers who died within six months of each other. Mm -hmm. Horrific, you know. But I think the saddest one is the one from the baby girl in New York. She Margaret. died, Margaret. But they don't even have a name for her. They just call her baby girl. Mm -hmm. I think that's sad. And then we have some of the translations. It was translated into 48 different languages. And this is the one I designed. And we launched that in New York. But I didn't transcribe it, you know, I, I just designed the um, cover. Making of the movie here in Limerick. And then we have some of Frank's ashes up here. You have Frank Record's ashes in that box? Wow. So Frank always let, wanted to leave some of his ashes to the soon, but it meant so much to him. He wasn't buried? No. He wants us, um, he, he just didn't want to be buried, honestly. He just decided he wanted to be cremated. But then you have these are paintings I did then of the story of Ash with Ashes. It's just to give a visual um, appearance. This is the way for his mother's ashes are. Most of them are very worried. And then this is the famous church where he made his first total communion. Do you remember the part where he dropped the Eucharist from his mouth and he had to go back to confession again? And the priest said, were you here a few minutes ago? So, he, you know, it was a very funny story. This is Sands Pub. The River Shannon that polluted everybody, he said. And this is our building. And this is the, the park where he plays soccer and he made, he made a team called the Sacred Hearts and he cut a heart out from his mother's dress. <laughs> and then you have the dispensary, which is called a dispensary because um, there were doctors and dentists there and checked the poor people. But the dispensary is probably, they had their own cough mic bottle and they'd bring it to the dispensary and they give uh, so much bottle in the bottle, the cough mixture. The railway station where he waited his father to come back, never came back. Vincent de Paul is next door to us where his mother went to beg for shoes and clothing for the kids. And these are some of the houses they lived in. Um, ironically, um, that house still stands and another house still stands. But the city council haven't put plaques up to say Frank lived here for such and such a time, which I find incredible. But um, this is the docks where the big ships would come in with the coal. And of course, they'd be bringing the coal from the, truck, from the um, ships to the, coal, to the trucks. And of course, a lot of it fall on the ground. So they go around with the pram, with the baby in the pram, and they'd actually put the coal into the pram. And the father gave out to them, why are you going down there, you know, picking up the streets? How do we survive, you know? This is the only um, time that Frank experienced sheets on his bed for the first time. He went to a hospital with conjunctivitis, and he liked it so much he went back for Christmas dinner, but they wouldn't allow him in. They left him in a ward on his own in case he contaminated the other patients. This is a shop called the Never and Ever shop. This is around the corner. She was an old lady and she felt sorry for people who had no money. So when they went in for milk and butter or whatever, pay me when you get the money. Mm -hmm. They never had the money, so mm -hmm. it was a Never and Ever shop. And these are all related to Frank as well, the library. Even Maliki was talking about that yesterday, saying the library was so important to them because they loved to read and they got so much pleasure and education out of reading and they're ferocious readers in England. This is the fish and chip shop where somebody threw a half-eaten bag of chips and Frank picked them up and brought them home for dinner that night. So it's, it's very sad, isn't it? <laughs>
Then you have, this is Angela, when she went to New York first, went, with her, went to be staying with her um, aunts. And then the next night she met the husband. Yeah. And this is a tribute to Frank when he passed away. Then you have the unveiling of the bust in the garden. Ellen, the night before the unveiling of the bust, Ellen said to me, can I just take one peek at it, please? I'd like to see it. So I said no, because she'd missed the whole spontaneous you know, reaction to it. So I said, can you wait just please? So she waited and said, wow, she said, she kissed him. So she loved it. Okay. These here are his grandparents on his father's side. And Alfie went up there once. And in actual fact, Alfie only met his father twice in his life. So it's sad. But I think she should be the man and he should be the, mommy, the mother. Because um, he's so feminine looking, isn't he? And this is Malachi. And this is Malachi late in life before he passed away. Angela. This is Frank at the age of 20 when he went to America. And then this is Frank later on in Limerick reading the book. This is Frank again and Billy beside him making his first tour of communion. And various photographs of the only tap in the street which they used. The coal man which Frank worked for and got conjunctivitis. And this is then his uncle, Ab Sheehan, who fell on his head as a child. Mm -hmm. This is the gate from his father's house in Belfast. Wow. I went up there at a funeral for Seamus Heaney and um, I found out where they lived and they were demolishing the house. Somebody had bought it, of course. And the gate was on a heap there and I said, is that the gate from the house? I said, yeah, you can have it. So my husband said, where are you going with the old gate? <laughs> this is actually very good. This is actually Angela's Christmas. It was launched during the week and it's a brilliant story. It's got Netflix are taking it. And it's going global in the month's time. So it's great fun. It's just showing you a communion dress that was cut down from a wedding dress from Canada. And it served 19 different families in America. This is the man that introduced me to Frank, Jim Kemi. Ironically, it's the White House in Limerick, not the White House in Washington, okay? But this is, he great friends with uh, Jim, Frank Rickley. This is interesting. When Frank passed away, Ellen, his widow, found all these um, rosary beads. So we think he was a closet Catholic. <laughs> and then these are some of the quotes that Frank had in his book. Happiness is hard to recall, it's just a glow. And then, sing your song, dance your dance, tell your tale. And this is Hoppy O'Halloran, his teacher. You might be poor, your shoes might be broken, but your mind is a palace. Mm. Remember that always. And this is the plaque to William Neamey, who actually instigated the school and bequeathed 13,300 in 1814, which is a lot of money. The school then closed in 1952. But he had great foresight to educate Catholics and Protestants together. And this is a sketch I did of the three brothers when they were here for the unveiling of the bust. And then behind you are just items that Frank won, some of the awards he won, and then his widow kindly gave them to me in the museum. And this is the bowl that contains Andrew's ashes. So we were very honoured. Malachi's wife, Diane, made that in our school. This is the cap and gown where Frank was honoured as a university student, uh, doctor here of literature. And he wrote a lovely message here behind me. That's the only autograph I have Mm. Wow. Yeah. And then you have bits and pieces of museum just to show you. Um, this feather was here the morning after Frank passing away. Wow. That's incredible, isn't it? Mm. Then you have various diaries of um, Angela coming home for her, her sister's funeral. The letter written to Angela from her husband. Not very romantic, very businesslike. This is famous Cyril, who went to school here with Frank, and he worked here in the factory. But he said about the, about the book when Frank brought out the book, said, oh, I don't like him. You know, I just didn't like him, because he was talking about him, so a great dancer with the sissy. Well, sissy was called with a skirt, 
When you were younger, you had a skirt and you were a boy, you were called a sissy, you know? But now it's okay, seemingly. This is the key from the front door, the headmaster's notebook, and some of the students. Wouldn't it be great if it was Frank's? Mm. Fortunately not. This is the school book, which is a brilliant book, 1925. And the scone I made earlier for Frank, okay? What did you say? The scone. scone. That's what they get in the morning and yeah. the afternoon, you know? So you can actually look at a virtual reality tour. I'm going to take upstairs now to show you the great bedroom kitchen. Step into 1930s and start Limerick. So we're stepping inside to Limerick 1930s. It's the home of Frank and... Um, the rest of the boys. So this is how they would have lived. And that's why I was saying to you earlier, and when Frank came, or when Alfie came to see the place, he just gave me a minute, he said, and recalled how he felt when in the house, you know. This is the thing they didn't have. So um, I said to Mal, get an artistic license. As you will see, everything's very religious, you know. In Ireland, we're very religious. We had statues, we had photos. Pictures, holy pictures everywhere. And this is showing you the pig's head. Do you remember the pig's head we had for the Christmas dinner? I do. That's the poorest of poorest to have for a Christmas dinner. Pig's head. Ordinary, you'd have a goose or a turkey. But I mean, Frank was very upset about buying the pig's head. And then, of course, this is the smoking, and she was smoking cigarettes. They would come 10 at a time. And I mean, it's so small, but they were called the coffin nails. Because they were pure tobacco, there was no filter on them. But you would have bought one or two at a time. Little tobacco, little. And this is the drink. Just showing how the father drank his drink. For the goodness that's the goodness. in it. Yes, <laughs> not very much. This is the tablecloth they'd use. Um, they'd use a paper to put a tablecloth. And this paper was printed in 1938 when Frank was eight. Oh my God, the kids were here yesterday. Sorry. There's 20, 120 kids, and they went berserk. Sorry, don't take that. <laughs> <laughs> and her hand is missing. She got her hand. Oh my God. <laughs> kids will be kids, won't they? Oh, I'll have to fix that wow. later. Sorry about this. So that's like Angela. This is supposed to be Angela sitting at the farm minding her babies. And I noticed I had a, I had a cigarette in her hand, but it's been taken by the kids. So I put another one in there. But this is the type of thing that we lived in. This was the tub. They'd wash themselves in and they'd also um, have have the washing, you know, use them for washing. This is the pram. That was actually a godsend for them because that was their mode of transport. If they didn't have rent for during the week for the rent, the landlord, they'd deal out during the night and they put all meagre possessions on it. So this is actually a very important piece of um, equipment for them. Then the father decided all the sewage was coming in under the door from the only toilet was beside them. So he decided to move them up to Little Italy because this is miserable. I mean, this is wet Ireland as such. So here we go. We're going up to Little Italy. This is actually the how they would have lived. And of course, more often than not, they'd all sleep in one bed to keep cuddling and warm. And that toy Frank played with the little boy, but it wasn't his Billy. Billy Campbell, his friend, his father made it. That's a horse and cart. And of course, Pope Leo the Thirteenth. If he was missing from the wall when Frank came home from school, then they'd no money for the rent. They're on the move. So every time Frank saw him on the wall, he said, "Oh, great, we're staying," you know. So that's the symbol of if they're moving or staying. And this is a mural I did then of the people that grew up in the lane with Frank. And a pram. You know, somebody's must have missed. There was no kids in this thing, But you can go behind the baby in the pram. I find that Frank's book was so mixed with humour and so sadness and whatever. Yes. That I felt you should mix a bit of humour with the sadness because um, it's now a musical. Frank's book is now a musical. So you don't fall. Oh, okay. So I find that um, you have to have a bit of humour, you know. This is actually the soap they would have used. That's horrible soap, actually. It's disinfection soap. 
And this is the cup mixture or the mixture that the father would take after having a session of drink. And if the shaving brush was out like that, it means to be looking for a job. More often than not, it was behind, you know. And the famous story is the landlord came for the rent and he said, um, where's my second room? And he said, well, you didn't rent us two rooms. I did, he said, I rent you two rooms. <laughs> oh, did you, she said. But Frank then piped up and said, yeah, would you the, down the division and purge in the fire? <laughs> <laughs> and these are the coats, um, the army coats that they use as, as duvets. I call those the duvets with the, sh with the sleeves. So this is sort of how they would have lived, really. And the potty, of course as um, Maliki calls that, the monster cup. <laughs> 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 so this bike was actually in the making of the movie. And the man who gave it to me committed suicide. He was a man of 89, which was that bad, you know. Poor, poor um, Joe, poor Joe. And this is a story just telling the um, how the two bedrooms, the two rooms were used and recreated. I just recreated these for just showing people because a lot of people, we had a Japanese guy here one time, I was on his own, and he said to me, leave me alone, leave me alone, you know. So I left him. I said, half an hour later, I was worried about him. I said, geez, that man, okay. So I came up again. I said, leave me alone, you're fine. Another hour later, I still came up. He was crying. Because he remembered his grandparents' house like this, you know, and it brought back terrible memories for him. But um, he sent me a lovely letter then, thanking me for having this museum, you know. So it was lovely. We get great people like you, for instance, now coming back. You know, we receive a little bit friendly. Oh, we have to come. We have to come. They actually come and visit. I have um, a couple coming back for the 14th time. Now they live in the mean, but they'll come back with family and whatever, because their, their uncles or whatever went to school here. But a lot of people who are planning to come here next year, like Americans, Germans, whatever, French, they're actually coming as soon as they can sure. to see it before it closes. But I mean, we have return visits now. We have a lot of people like would do two or three tours for 10 years, come back. Oh God, you've added this, you've added that. They recognize stuff, but I don't think about it, you know. But a lot of them feel, oh, okay. Three, seven and a half thousand people have emailed me. Please don't close. That's seven and a half thousand people. Now, these are foreign people. These are not indigenous Irish people. They're living here are from Limerick, which needs to be from Limerick. But it's just that it's on their own doorstep and don't realize that, you know? You're passing a gold mine every day. You know, and you don't, it doesn't shine in your eyes mm -hmm. until it's just the light goes out. Pearls before swine. That is life, my dear, for entrepreneurs. You have a great thing, but having a great thing is not enough. The marketing of what you do is a hundred times more important than what you actually do. I mean, it costs money, as you know, to, to actually put a thing together. Yeah. But I did it with a passion, probably, without thinking of the day that it might finally be not a year. And I, I never thought of that. In actual fact, that's the first time I've actually said it. But um, it's, it's heartbreaking to close it. And Frank's ashes are here, so he, he knows he knows what Limerick has done to him as such, that they sort of ignored him, and they ignored him again. You know, he was a great man for spreading his story worldwide, and all he did was tell his story, you know. But yet, there was nobody standing up to the plate and say, listen, let's save this place. I had a huge banner inside the building, a huge portable banner. Save our building. That was with the story you see. Unfortunately, my husband, that's another book. Unfortunately, my husband invested in Moscow with all the money that he got from him when he changed the factory. His father left him the business with his brother. Unfortunately, his brother died last year. And uh, John thought he'd all this money. And somebody met him and said, You should invest that in Moscow. So he lost all his money. In Russia? In Russia. 
An Irish man had a Chinese restaurant in Moscow. Can you fathom that? I yeah. can. Yeah. So the mafia just ruined him, you know? That's another book. That's another book. That's another book. What do you think the great lesson is of Frank McCord? That out of the depths of poverty, you can be there. You can be amongst the greatest. And he is one of the greatest writers. And I, I think the lesson is um, humility and narrative. The telling the story is very important. I mean, that's be able to tell the story and the way he told it. So simple. There's so much humor, so much, you know. He wasn't begrudging. Well, he was begrudging to the Catholic Church because they were a law to themselves. They said, don't do whatever, and they do whatever you're supposed to do. But they were paranoia. I think religion is ridiculous, you know, to take to an extreme, always. But I felt that Frank has left a legacy of how to tell your story. And so, so many people have seen it all over the world. I won't repeat the story, but I'm going to close it. But um, everything goes. Sad, isn't it? I'm great that you're here. I'm great that you're here. It's a lucky thing I made it here. It really is. And how did you know about the museum? I, I, you know, I knew that there was a statue of Frank McCoy really? in Limerick. So that's why we came. I said, hey, you know, we were on a trip. We've been traveling for the last few weeks. And when I was putting together the trip, I said, oh, we're going to stop off in Dublin and we're going to go see the statue of Frank the Court. Like, can we put that there? <laughs> did, you know, did you know that there was a museum to have a memory, is it? I didn't you know. You didn't know. I didn't know that I would even have, I, I really didn't know. But I'm glad that we did come. Yeah, and this is his school. This is I his. mean, his spirit is here. That's why it's, it's like It's very fitting, you know, yeah. that because he was teacher. I mean, to me, he was always a teacher. I understand that he was more than that in the world. But, I mean, when I, I mean, when we sat at desks, not much different from these. Mm -hmm. They were narrower yeah. for one person Probably at a time. Yeah. One person at a yeah. time. My desks were from early 1900s, our desks in yeah. our school, too. And he would come in, and I, I don't know, I think he was about my age when he was my teacher. He probably was, yeah. I'm 54. Yeah. He probably was. Yeah. Yeah, he would have been. And he would come in, and he would, he would never, he would hardly ever teach us like, regular. regular stuff. He would just tell stories, or he would complain about how he had to shave with dull razor blades. And he was scraping, scraping the beard off of his face because he didn't have any sharp razor blades. That's, that's and would he tell you about prose and grammar and... Hardly at all. Hardly at all. Hardly at all. Yeah. He would say, you have to write what you know, which is your own stories. That's what he would say. So he'd actually every day tell you a story of his childhood? That's all I remember. That's all I remember. And, and, I, and I remember that he and Malachi would would do their off-Broadway show of like, the Blackers. Yeah, they brought here to Limerick first. They did brochures there in the glass case. Yeah. A couple of Blackguards. But uh, they brought it here to the Bell Table in 1980-something, I think. I think, well, before he wrote his book. Sure. That's where he got all the ideas for his book. And as somebody said, you can't take your dreams away from people. You don't take your dreams away from people. Because, I mean, that's all he had really at the time. And then he became famous before he passed away, which is like an artist, you know, like Van Gogh. He only saw one painting in his lifetime, and that was to his uncle. Right. You know, and look at him today. But you have to die before you become famous, but at least Frank saw the fame. He was so famous. Oh. Even my dad knew who he was. I said, Dad, did you hear about my creative writing teacher from high school? He wrote a book and won the Pulitzer Prize. And my dad goes, You mean the Irish guy? <laughs> Isn't it fantastic? Isn't it? <laughs> he, it's fantastic, you know. I mean, I'm so happy for him that he experienced love. Well, he had three wives, but the third one was enemies to love, I think. And uh, to experience the, the fame before he passed away, because I think it's great to be recognized the way he was, and fair use to him for telling his story and putting it down. 
because there's another, I mean, there's another few people, people out there that would write, but I, I think he's a special writer. To me, I can, I can appreciate every word he's put on paper because um, I just feel, just, just feel his presence is here. And how many people that come in here feel it? He's, he was an amazing writer. There, you know, I, after graduating... Would you just realize that I've got to turn off my soup? Go turn off no, the soup. No, this is home. I better ring my husband to turn off the soup. Go, Sorry, yeah. guys. I nearly burned the house up. We went to my holidays and I had a cake in the oven. <laughs> I said, the, cake, the house is very warm. <laughs>
because the dad was amazing for telling stories and things, and the mother seemed to play. So I think it's, it's in our Irish DNA, probably, that it's, we're great for telling stories. Like, if you ask for directions, if you're on a road and you're driving, and you pull up and you say, which way is such a, oh, who would you be now? <laughs> where, how was your, where are you from? You know, oh, geez, you must be related to me down the road and stuff. But they find a connection. And then the story of what, that's how Irish people are amazing. Like if you go in on holidays, you're sitting beside somebody at the beach and you get caught talking. So what you oh, what? You're related to my first cousin. You know, it's, it's amazing. It's, a thing. it's an Irish thing. I think it's an Irish thing. I don't know if it happens to any other country people like uh, any other uh, nationality. Because the French are very reserved. Like when you go on holidays and you're French beside you, they won't. They won't converse, converse like the Irish. The Irish wants to know, what do you have last night for dinner? <laughs> what are you having tomorrow night? Where are you going for a drink? I'll meet you. You know, they've, it's just they, they want to know everything about you and how, how they can be part of you. You know, even if you're sitting down in a pub, you can't have a pie drink in a pub. Because they, they sort of, hi, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you'd ever walk into a pub and just sit there and read. As the barman would actually shout across the way what's your name? And it connects you, you know? So it's, it's just, it's a special thing about the Irish. But again, with Frank's story, I think is the way he told his story. You know, and he just was so happy that so many people read his book and so many different, like the movie was made, the, he'd be happy now with the story of Angel and the baby Jesus. That's incredible. You know, it's a brilliant story. It's out of Christmas, it's out of last Christmas. But it's great. And then there was a, um, a Richard Harris, there is a Richard Harris um, festival of music on, or a film for the week, and that is shown on Monday night. And the making of the behind the scenes of Angela's Baby Christmas. And Malik was there and he was talking. And he was telling his story. And there's very nearly another new movie in that because he was talking, he went on and on too much, but I mean, you can't stop Maliki once he starts talking. It's all to do with the narrative, isn't it? And you, you said the words humility and humble. Uh, do you think that was the, the, the key to Frank McCourt's appeal? I, I think so. Plus, it, the story appealed to everybody. And it wasn't very, it was a very, um, even late in life when I met him, he was after starting to write the book he was written at that stage. He, really, he didn't, he sort of drifted into the building. He didn't sort of stomp in like, I'm writing a book, you know, guess who I am. But even then he became famous and things. He was very humble. Like when he opened an exhibition in New York, uh, he opened a chat or whatever, he said, we well, you know, I couldn't be to spend much time with you. But at four o'clock in the morning, so I better go home. <laughs> so that's when you always sing some typically Irish and whatever. But he actually then he gave his few words. He said, "Now, Una, would you like to say a few words?" Yeah. Una doesn't stop for the few words. <laughs> so I'll tell you as bad as that. Excuse me. But um, he loved to talk. He loved conversation. So and that's the art of it, really, isn't it? <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Oh, I'm getting emotional now. That's, as a, as a guy said, that's life, is it? <laughs> that's life. That's life. Like all people say. Well then, well, I can, I can look at this place and never come back again. Just that uh, I've done it, you know. All these things have to go. <coughs> You've done it all right. So I'm going to give you a special gift. Wait there a second. Oh, yay. Let me see.
learned my lesson at Leamy School. Oh, that's fantastic. So sweet. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Great to have you. I must do a sketch of it. Let you sketch of it. Yeah. Have you got kids, children? I have a daughter who is 24, 24 years old. You have a daughter 24 years of age? You're joking. Mm -hmm. And have you got children? Nope. No children? Nope. Just a great dog at home. Great dog at home. Yeah, we miss our dog. Yeah, what sort of dog is it? She's a Shiba Inu. What's a Shiba Inu? Shiba Inu. She's a Japanese dog. Is she small? 20 pounds. 20 pounds? She's a tiny little thing, is she? She normally goes to the left of the, of the table and goes underneath the table in his bed. But he was in the corner looking at me as if saying, I'm sick. I really am sick, you know. So I, I looked again and he was falling asleep. So I said, right the vet again. I said, John, he really isn't well, you know. Oh, he said, Una, bring him over. So and I'll have a look at him if you're really worried about him. So I brought him over and he put him up on the table and straight away he felt him. Oh, I've to operate him straight away. He had a hernia, but if he didn't operate, he'd die. Oh. So it was not lucky I felt his extra little ball, you know. So wow. he had a hernia. Oh my so goodness, thank God. But it's funny the way the dog went from there where he normally sleeps to over there. So I'd see him. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. And the other time, another dog we had, our kid was... Barry was going to a boarding school, he wanted to go to this boarding school. So I wrote off asking would he be accepted, whatever. And the headmaster rang me and he said, we'd be delighted to have Barry as a, as a school pupil in our school. He's got a brilliant pedigree. He was the dog's birth cert I sent instead of Barry's birth cert. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a brilliant pedigree. <laughs> oh, and the same dog actually, my husband took him to a rugby match. And it was 12 o'clock at night, and I said, that dog is out very late. Forget about John, you know. But, I mean, he's having his pints probably. That dog is out very late. Next thing, the doorbell rang. It was a taxi man. He said, do you have a dog called Polly? I said, I do. Polly, you're home. <laughs> 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 oh, that's your... She's a character. I think she's wired for the moon, though, is she? Yeah. <laughs> oh, she's mad. That's the biggest show, you know. Yeah, John Nelson said to me, now relax, Una. He said, um, that's um, it's only five million people listening to you. I said, ah, oh, <laughs> thank you. I feel great, yeah. I've been on that show. Have you? Yeah. Yeah. It's a wild show, isn't it, though? Was there like a hundred people in the studio? Oh, yeah. Right? They were all over. Isn't it funny? Yeah. This is just a bit of fun, okay? Like a cat. I'll just stick him in Yay. there, okay? Thank you. Yay. Now you can take a photograph of I this. will. I'm unknown sources. Frank's VR. This is actually brilliant. Um, I drew out the house from old memories and things, and I sent it to Maliki. And Maliki then did the voiceover, and a student then in the university did this as his degree um, project, and he got an honour. So it's, um, come on. I, I don't know. I'm good at that when a few days back. I've got a couple more books to read. How many more books do you read? I've got two or three now. Actually, I'm tired of them.